We're pleased to have Jay Lakani here. He's qualified as a theoretical physicist, specializing in quantum theory under the tutorship of Sir Roger Penrose. He has been a Hindu educationalist working with schools, colleges, and universities. He's a director of the Hindu Academy and was appointed as the first Hindu tutor by Eton College. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me at the back? After Benjamin's very articulate introduction, it's all downhill from now. Let me just tidy up. I've got a wonderful friend sitting here called Frenny Ben, and I've decided to make my presentation in a language that Frenny Ben can relate to. So no Sanskrit lingo, no technical lingo, just simple English. Frenny Ben, okay? Okay, we go for it. It is possible to present very subtle ideas in very simple English without really kind of referring or getting lost in a jargon of jungle. You know, jungle of jargons. That's the, bit, the worst thing that scientists do. Now, my own background is actually theoretical physics, and I especially studied quantum mechanics because I thought there was the most wonderful thing in physical or physical sciences. Something very grand was happening there. So I focused on it. And I was taught by perhaps the, the, the number one quantum physicist in the country, Sir Roger Penrose. So I come from the right pedigree. So not some hippie physicist, yahoo, like that. Okay, so what is my presentation? You see, the existential question that we are kind of addressing is simply saying simple English. Normally we say where, when, how, etc. This is how human beings interact with using this where, when, how questions. But the most important question human beings forget to address is what? What is this? Who am I? And what is the nature of reality in front of me? What is the question? Existence. What is, ex what is this? And that is the way we begin the journey. Now, before I make the journey, start the journey saying, what the heck is all this about? Who is this? What is going on? And who am I? An interesting issue arises. You have to first of all try and sort yourself out. Who am I? To question. Because if you are a dunce, then a very dunce-like answer will satisfy you. So you need to check out your own credentials before you make sense of the world around you. So the first journey is journey inward. What is our own makeup? Who are we? What is our essential nature? So the first part of the question is, who the heck are we? What is our true nature? Here, we actually agree with Darwin that we are nothing but the extension of the living kingdom from the single cell being. We come, become so complex through accidents of evolution until we get this human form. We agree with Darwin. We like Darwin, a lovely chap. But we dislike we kind of part company with Dawkins. Because Darwin says we are extension of material, extension of animal kingdom. We say, yes, good, good, good chap. And then Dawkins says, no, 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 Mr. Lakani, we are extension of the material kingdom. There's nothing more to you than lumps of carbon and they got mixed up. Here we say, no, 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 hang, hang on. This is getting out of control. And this is what we are going to explore now. What is our true nature? Now, you see, as we move from the insect to the animal to the human level, at the, human, at, the, at the level of the animals, we operate at the level of instinct. We hear a noise, we get frightened, we fear, we fly, whatever. We're basically operating purely at the level of instinct. Once we enter the human kingdom, we discover something else. We got something called the intellect. So we now begin to discover that we create a different dimension to our being, not just the physical dimension at the animal kingdom, but a metaphysical dimension we can call the mind. But more important than the mind is this determining faculty the mind possesses, which is called intellect. This ability that we all have naturally of putting things into boxes and then linking up the boxes, induction and deduction logic. So once we enter the human kingdom, we suddenly discover, wow, we've got this extra faculty we can make sense of the world in a very structured manner. Link things up. So far, so good. So we say now, from the, hum from the animal to the human, we get this extra faculty called the intellect, which allows us to make better sense of the world. So I'm just exploring my own being to see how can I relate to the world. Oh, I've got the intellect, very clever, good, good job. We go forward. Then you see, suppose we discover that we are just nothing more than intelligent animals that know how to eat with knife and fork. Are we making any progress? Are we really re recognize our true dignity? You know, when I pass near a hotel chain, there's a nice saying in red, saying, eat, drink, sleep. Is this the aim of life? 
eat, drink and sleep. And then if you pass near a pub, you'll see the sign, eat, drink, laugh. Of course, after getting drunk, you might laugh for no reason. Is it the aim of life? Then of course, in no time, you'll find the undertaker will put a sign, eat, drink, die, so we can sort you out. You're not smiling, guys, come on, lighten up. Even though I'm presenting very subtle ideas, you can be presented in simple English. And then we talk to Richard Dawkins. What's the aim of life? What are we all about? He will say, my friend, the aim of life is eat, drink, and procreate. Let those replicators keep replicating this aim of life. Now he has discovered his own levels. Purely at the animal level, he stops. He's not able to recognize the greater dignity and divinity that is, avail, you know, is visible in the human, human, human frame. This is what I'm all about. We start as animals. Once we enter the human kingdom, we discover extra faculties. But underpinning our intellect and our mind, there's something much deeper. Because Descartes said, we think, therefore we are. So that means I will stop at the level of my mind. My mind gives me the identity of who I am. Then you say, no, 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 there's much deeper level. You are not what you think. That's the biggest problem. You are something more than what you think you are. So what are we? They'll say, what are we? We say we are actually spiritual. And Dawkins will say, no, Mr. Lakani, uh, you are just material beings aspiring to the idea of spirituality to improve your kind of material status. There's nothing more than that. We say, no, no, no. We're essentially spiritual beings on a material journey. And of course, I get challenged by the science lobby. They say, Mr. Lakani, you are a physicist. Be physical. This all this airy, fairy, woolly stuff called spirit, we don't believe in stuff like that. The only spirit we believe in comes in bottles at the off license. We say, no, there's much more to us than meets the eye. Not the body, not the mind, not the intellect. Something deeper that we all possess. You say, but Mr. Lakani, it's nice to hear stuff like that, but how can we be sure there's something deeper to us? And this is where I come in. It is at the cutting edge discoveries of modern sciences that we are discovering a deeper dimension to reality, to ourselves as well as the world we encounter. So what's that? You see, when we try and explore what is our true nature and dig deeper, not stop at the mind or the intellect, go deeper, this is purely experiential, not something that you can intellectualize. And sometimes Mr. they say, Mr. Lakhani, but if you can't intellectualize spirit, why bother with it? This is out of, out of your domain. You can't articulate it in a rational manner. So what is this spirit stuff? Why is it so invisible? The answer is this. If it was visible, it was the material thing, you'd put it in bottles and sell it in Sainsbury's. If it was purely intellectual, then do you know what you've done? You destroyed the whole element of spirit. It has to be invisible, even in, through the inter, to the intellect. If it was possible to grab this spirit thing through your network of intellect, we love intellect. Then do you know what you do? The spirit becomes a lapdog of your intellect. It has lost all its power. It loses its potency. So I say it's a good thing you can't catch it. I say, but how can we trust it? It's for real. How do we know? The nearest words we use to define this idea of the spirit as our true nature, is the nearest word we can come to is is of the nature of consciousness. Consciousness. You say consciousness sounds like a casual word. We are all conscious. So what's the big deal? There's a big deal here. Because consciousness hides a very important aspect of our true, true nature. And again, I get challenged by the science lobby, especially by the biologists, saying, look, Mr. Lakani, this was a debate at the House of Lords once. Look, Mr. Lakani, consciousness is nothing more than a brain phenomena. Some electrical and chemical activity in your brain creates a fuzz that you call consciousness. It's just an output of the physical brain. Grow up, Mr. Lakani, learn. I said, oh, hang on, hang on. It's not that straightforward. They say, it is that straightforward. Suppose you don't agree with us. We can come with you with an injection of anesthetic, and you'll go, oh. See, we disturb your brain function, and your consciousness goes. And suppose we don't like you, we'll come with a hammer and thump you in the head. And your consciousness is gone. See, I told you, it's a brain phenomena. It sounds right, doesn't it? And yet, it's not right. I'm very naughty, and I say, look, I'll give you another metaphor. Tricky things make up metaphors. I say, suppose a youngster comes into the room and starts playing with the dimmer switch. The switch goes one way, the light comes on. 
the switch goes the other way, the light goes off. The youngster will immediately do a causal, causal relationship saying, the switch creates light. You can't blame him, can you? Cause and effect. Sounds so sensible. But then I say, look, if you were grown up, you said, tell the youngster, look, my friend, the switch does not create light in electricity. It is a mere conduit that allows light to or electricity to flow through. See, we are mature, we are clever, you little chap, you don't know stuff like that. It's just a conduit. This is what I have to tell the science lobby. The brain you thought is creating consciousness is just a mere switch through which consciousness percolates, comes out. It is required. So if you break the switch, you don't touch my consciousness. You have just broken the switch. And they say, I mean, the Susan Greenfield one, Mr. Lucky, that's a very good metaphor. There's something more to us that requires a material frame to manifest itself, but it is not manufactured by the material frame. We are not an output of matter. Now you say, okay, nice, interesting metaphor. How does it stand up to the challenges of science and rationality? We live in a world full of science and rationality. We love stuff to be scientific. It stands up extremely well. You see, some of the examples that Petman gave, in a way, is reflecting that. The reason why I was drawn to quantum physics is precisely this. If you really look at the most physical of physical sciences, not biology, not chemistry, I'm not going to undermine any of you, the most physical of physical sciences, physics, is the most pretentious of all sciences, telling all the other sciences to come and sit at my feet and crack coconuts. I'm your mommy. So physics is most important. In physics, lies a phenomena right at the heart of physics, not at the periphery, not a minor issue. Right at the heart of physics lies this phenomena called the quantum. Just a few more literal, you know, kind of linguistic. Sorry, please excuse me for any man. It's called quantum. Now suppose people say, how do you, in fact, one of the main major physicists called Richard Feynman used to go to every university and say, chaps, you know how to do quantum? Say, yes, we know. Do you know what it means conceptually? Not a single hand has ever gone up. What's going on? It's a very, very weird stuff. In fact, the father of quantum physics said that if you come across the phenomena of quantum and you don't start feeling dizzy, that means you don't understood it. But then if you're feeling dizzy, that doesn't mean quantum has hit you. Be careful. That means you have to see a physician. But the idea is this. Why is there, why are they becoming dizzy with the phenomena of quantum? This is the reason. They are discovering, this is why science is rattled, physics is rattled. And when physics is rattled, all of the science is also beginning to start sneezing. So what is the rattling stuff? This is my conclusion of quantum, which agrees with the original founders of quantum physics. He says, my friends, if you think you can explain this creation in terms of sticks and stones, or smaller versions of sticks and stones, you know, little tiny little pesky little thing called atoms, electrons, and all this, then my friend, says quantum physics, you'll be disappointed. The underpinning to this reality is certainly not physical. Physics is saying it's not physical. So what is it then? What is it? Well, you can call it metaphysical, you can call it mathematical, but certainly not physical. And again, let me touch on this word. The word metaphysics has not been properly understood. People think it's, it's a woolly thing that comes out of physics, a physical brain. The word metaphysics was originally invented to say more than physical, metaphysical. So it has not been properly understood. So what's metaphysical? You see, for, in us, for, us, for us to grab reality, we require a tool which is non-physical. Otherwise, you can't gra gra grab reality. In fact, one of the best kind of mathematicians this country saw, Bernard Russell, was asked, what is mathematics? And his answer was very pointed, very straight, and you can see how clear thinker he is. He said, my friend, I have no clue what it is, where it comes from, but it works, and we have got it. This is called metaphysical. See? All of your sciences are based on metaphysical, mathematical. You say, but what's mathematical? It's like it's all these squiggles that give us headaches. You know, I come from physics lobby, let me tidy up. All the headaches will go away. You don't need aspirin anymore. You see all these squiggles, what are this? In order for human beings to try and grab reality, if you can get a handle on reality, you require a string of words. So when you notice, language is not something with which you communicate with other human beings. Language is the way you communicate to yourself. In order for you to understand, you need a string of words. You can't otherwise grasp reality. Animals can't do it, we can do it. We can grasp reality with a finer way, 
because you've got language. But then, do you know how masterful human beings are? This linguistic skill we have, the more elaborate language you have, the better grasp of your reality. The more your vocabulary, the bigger, better the grasp of reality. In the age of Stone Age men, he just said a few grunts, oh, water, oh, woman. But we have grown, developed fantastic language. But you know how far we have gone? <clears throat> language has become articulated as mathematics. Mathematics is nothing but, if you like, very articulate, symbolic language we use to understand the nature of reality. Get a finer and finer grasp of reality. So when you see all this, you know, we are quantum equations. So how what's all that? Nothing but elaborate gymnastics, mental gymnastics required to grab reality. When you see it in that sense, you realize that metaphysics is not a minor thing. And if they create reality is not physical but metaphysical, don't think this is something minor. This is major. The physical world is minor. I did a TED talk saying, challenging the paradigm of materialism, that we are nothing more than extension of material kingdom. It's time to give it up. It's very difficult. Just you've got some very dogmatic religious you know, personalities stuck on religion. You've got some very dogmatic scientists who cannot let go of matter, including my own professor, Roger Penrose. He walked with his, almost his life trying to see if he can link quantum with consciousness. But how do you do it? Did he go in metaphysical? No, no, no. He said, you see the, the microtubules and the, the skeletons of your brain, so this is where quantum phenomena occurs. Come on, get out of matter. It's necessary to think outside the box, outside the material box. We are something much more than matter. And this is, this is, if you like, not me, physics telling us. And the only way you can escape this particular phenomena is to touch on what Pejman mentioned, multiverses. Now, multiverse, let me tell you how horrible, horrible this idea is. It is telling us that in order for you to avoid the word consciousness coming into physics, the only way you can avoid it is to say that while I'm talking to you, at every infinitesimal moment of time, not even one second, every infinitesimal moment of time, infinite, infinite copies of ourselves have been moving out from each other. So in one, one universe, my hair is like this, in another is like this. So every, every infinitesimal moment of the time, the universe is breaking up into infinite copies. Now, If you're prepared to agree with that, you are thrown the towel in. This is called divergence with a vengeance. So instead of physics becoming more convergent, that's the aim of physics, it's becoming divergent with, with vengeance. Why? They don't want to embrace the word that I love to embrace, consciousness, something special manifesting with the body, and yet it is not part of the body. This is underpinning to our being. Our essential nature is spiritual. And the nearest handle we have on, what do we mean by spiritual? Say, consciousness. And consciousness is something that is produced by any slice of the brain. Be careful, check out. It seems to be everywhere and nowhere. And yet, you can't grab it. So I'm just telling you, now, through modern physics, quantum, and through modern neuroscience, consciousness, we are now recognizing a deeper dimension to reality, the world around us, as well as our own being. And that, my friends, is what I mean by spiritual humanism. It is necessary to shift emphasis from a very highly stodgy, lifeless, materialistic humanist theology that's kind of very strongly kind of advocated. It is necessary to move, and I keep shoving, you know, Andrew Copson, the chief, you know, the, Chief Executive of British Humanism said, come on, Andrew, grow up. Not materialistic humanism, spiritual humanism. Say, no, Jay, go away. Because I'm telling him to give up, get up, think outside the material box. And unfortunately, a lot of scientists are struggling to think outside the box and see a deeper dimension to reality. Thank you, my friends.